Have you ever wondered who the richest person in Zelda was? Hmm, it must be Mila's father, right? He did pitch in a fortune to have his daughter rescued after all. Then again, it might be that guy Giovanni, who traded his soul for a bunch of treasure. Wait, or it could just be Link with his magical giant wallets. <laughs> well, truth be told, it's none of the above. In fact, you'll probably be surprised who it actually is. Yes, the 35-year-old wannabe fairy, Tingle. So the big question is, how did this unlikely figure amass his wealth? Well, it started one day when producer Kensuke Tanabe told his boss, Nintendo needs to start promoting characters other than Mario and Link. But Tanabe realized that Tingle wasn't seen as a very cool character, especially in the US. Which is also the reason why the EAD team decided not to include Tingle after Wind Waker. But all in all, Tanabe had confidence that he could make everybody love Tingle if his game was well made. Freshly picked Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land was released in September of 2007. Things start off with a middle-aged man getting worn out by the daily grind of the rat race. Miraculously, given the opportunity to experience the infinite wealth of Rupee Land, he accepts. And oh, you made a name? Nope, you're Tingle now. <laughs> One rather interesting thing about this game is how it reflects life and society in the real world. If the title isn't enough of a hint, this game is all about rupees. Or simply money. Rupees are your life. Rupees solve all problems. And rupees will get you to Rupee Land. Even though there are dungeons and monsters, this game is nothing like Zelda. Personally speaking, the battles are rather disappointing because all you do is tap the screen as fast as you can. Dungeons often drag on and become extremely tedious, but the boss fights are plenty of fun. Though by far the best part about Tingle's Rosy Rupee Land is the humor. If Tingle's bizarre reactions aren't enough, then for sure the bridge fixing spandex men won't let you down. Boom. Boom, boom, boom. Shortly following the release of this game, Nintendo decided to reward its Club Nintendo users in Japan with Tingle's Balloon Fight DS. If the name and gameplay you're seeing isn't enough of a hint, then you're missing out on an NES classic. Simple yet addicting. Speaking of the NES, do you guys remember this neat little device over here? If you do, then you're probably familiar with its successor, the Wii Zapper. E3 of 2006 was when it debuted, but shockingly, Nintendo didn't push out a single compatible game for over a year. This was when Miyamoto started formulating a Zelda on-rail shooter. However, the overall Japanese gaming audience viewed FPS games as something too difficult to get into. Hence, Miyamoto wanted to show them that not every FPS is doomed to on Nightmare Mode. Rather, they can be fun and easy too. The game was released in November of 2007 called Lynx Crossbow Training. Now I can't for the life of me remember where I put my Wii Zapper. So this will have to do. Perfect shot. Well, let's see how perfect you are. Hmm, not bad. This is actually really fun for an add-on game. Definitely holds its own for an on-rail shooter. Being able to move Link around in some areas feels great. On top of that, it's a blast being able to revisit the Twilight Princess world and sniping away. Prior to starting our Zelda series, I knew Japanese gamers had different preferences compared to the West. But never would I have guessed just how different. Well, turns out it's a whole other world. 
Feeling a bit disappointed with the sales of Wind Waker, Aonuma has stated that he wanted to start taking Zelda in a direction that caters more to casual gamers, specifically in the Japanese market. Which I found a bit surprising, considering hardcore and competitive gaming is nothing new to Japan. Starting off with a small team of five, development began in 2004. Looking at how much fun everyone was having with Four Swords Adventures at the time, some of the devs wanted to bring that concept over to the DS. However, Aonuma was like, no no no, let's create a new Zelda. One that will become a DS standard. Then, it dawned on him, the stylus. Putting yourself in the shoes of a very casual gamer, many of the Zelda titles honestly aren't the easiest thing to pick up and play. Like, how do I use this item? So you're saying, I gotta open this menu, then press this button, then the button again, plus I gotta figure out where to use it? I think I'll pass. Oh look, a new smartphone game! Okay, so back to the stylus. Aonuma felt he could use it to bridge the gap between the casual audience and the Zelda controls. Initially, all the action happened on the top screen while the bottom was just a map you control Link with, similar to Hotel Dusk. Though that was soon ditched, since Aonuma felt it disconnected players too much. And in the end, we got this. <laughs> The game was released in October of 2007, called The Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass. Following Ganondorf's brutal execution and the sinking of Hyrule, Tetra and Link set out to find uncharted land. They soon come across the notorious ghost ship. Being the fearless girl that she is, Tetra hopped right on, consequently getting herself kidnapped right after. With a leap of faith, Link attempts to board the ship epically fails, and finds himself on Merkei Island, where he sets off to find Tetra. Huh? Speaking of islands, there was an interesting concept of one that never made it into the final game. Every time Link visited this place, a new part would be added, until it looks something like this. So, did the game manage to win the hearts of the casual audience, like Aonuma wanted? Well... I'd say, hell yeah. Using the stylus to control Link's movement and his weapons felt marvelous. Though the sound effect of a jump slash is questionable. In terms of puzzles, there are so many little intuitive things which made brilliant use of what the DS had to offer, such as blowing out candles with the mic, closing your DS to imprint something on your map, jotting down landmarks to uncover treasure, and the list just goes on and on. I'd have to say this is one of the more creative Zelda titles the devs have made, but definitely isn't perfect by any stretch. Temple of the Ocean King, or what I'd like to call the temple that ruins everything. Prepare to see this mini dungeon a lot. The game makes you constantly return to progress through it, bit by bit. It wouldn't be a problem if Link could skip straight to where he left off, but you have to redo the entire dungeon every single time. It's just a pain in the ass. Watch out! And similar to Wind Waker, the long boat rides don't help either. But overall, the good definitely outweighs the bad. And interesting enough, according to Club Nintendo registrations, there was a noticeable increase in females after the release of Phantom Hourglass. And that begs the question, are the majority of casual gamers girls? <laughs> Immediately after the completion of Phantom Hourglass, Aonuma knew there was much, much more potential with what they've already made. Without further ado, he gathered the same devs back up and started a new project. Before anything, Aonuma stepped forward with quite an eager proposal. Let's take Zelda back on land. After the past two Oceanic games, he missed the vast landscape and the adventurous feeling of uncharted areas appearing over the horizon. 
Now the question was, what will be Link's transportation? Coincidentally, Aonuma recalled a storybook he read to his son called The Tracks Go On. It was about a group of kids building a railroad to explore and avoid obstacles. And he felt this concept was a perfect fit for Zelda. Interesting enough, he further states that players were able to freely lay down tracks anywhere they wanted. Unfortunately, the idea was dropped halfway through, cause it turned out too complex and confusing. The game was released in December of 2009 called The Legend of Zelda Spirit Tracks. Following the events of Phantom Hourglass, Link and Tetra finally struck land where they built a new kingdom. A hundred years later, we find Nico, who's somehow still alive. About to send Link off to get his engineering certificate, a series of betrayal and conspiracy unfolds, knocking Link out and turning Zelda into a ghost. The pair must then set out to recover the spirit tracks. <laughs> Finally, after 23 years, it's about time a Zelda game was actually about Zelda. And this was all thanks to one man, director Iwamoto. When the team had decided on partnering Link up with the sidekick, Iwamoto was given the task of choosing who. Wanting to portray a character in his own way, plus realizing that Princess Zelda was essentially a blank slate, he jumped at the opportunity. And I think he did a great job with her character. She gives off that slightly naive and kind personality that you'd expect from a young princess. <laughs> On the other hand, the devs were very picky when designing Link's new outfit. Concepts range from simple overalls to a formal captain, but I'm glad they settled with more casual worker clothes. Okay, enough chatter about the characters. First off, massive, massive improvement from Phantom Hourglass. They fixed almost everything that was wrong. Yes, there's still a central temple you have to constantly revisit, but the new teamwork mechanics between Link and Zelda makes it feel fresh every time. And this may be a bold statement, but I think Spirit Tracks has the coolest instrument. It's mainly thanks to the microphone and touchscreen, which makes your DS feel like a real pan flute. Alright, so moving on, you guys are probably itching to hear about this title. But the dude in the green jumpsuit is eager as always to steal some of Link's spotlight. Two Tingle games were released in Japan shortly after Spirit Tracks, called Dekasuke ni Tingle Pack and Irozuki Tingle no Koino Balloon Trip. The first is a DSiWare title consisting of some applications and minigames, one of which you make Tingle dance in front of your pictures. But be warned, it can get kinda creepy. As for Tingle's Balloon Trip, it's a point-and-click adventure where you must help Tingle find a girlfriend. If you haven't already noticed, the game is a huge parody of The Wizard of Oz. And if you wondered what game has the worst voiceovers ever, look no further. So finally, we got everything Tingle out of the way. Now this next title we're getting into actually had quite a lengthy development period, spanning five whole years. Culprit B? The Wii Motion Plus was developed around this time, and the devs wanted it for the next Zelda, but little did they know just how much crap they were getting themselves into. It's true, this beast was sharp and precise, but at the same time, extremely hard to tame. They tried a bunch of things, but none of it turned out right. While they were racking their brains over this problem, the first Wii Motion Plus game was released, Wii Sports Resort. Director Fujibayashi recalls playing around with it and trying to take pointers, but his efforts were futile. The problem was Link's entire motion control moveset had to happen at any time under the player's will, as opposed to this, where various motions could be segmented. At last, Onuma tossed in the towel after several years of breaking his neck over it. The team happily returned to the Wiimote Nunchuck. And this. This is where tensions reach skyward. After the button controls were finalized, Aonuma had the audacity to request his team to return to the Motion Plus. Well, of course they had to. 
Work atmosphere was bleak for a while. Everyone really dug deep to make this thing work, going as far as studying the movements of a human skeletal body. After some time, the controls were finally shaping up. The game was released in November of 2011, called The Legend of Zelda Skyward Sword. Chronologically, this game is the start, the alpha, the spark that led us through all this. Well, let's take a look at how the legend began. In the beginning, three goddesses created the Triforce and left it in the hands of Hylia. Demise stirred up a war in an attempt to steal it. In hopes to protect the humans, Hylia put them on a piece of land and sent it above the clouds. Thousands of years have passed, Skyloft was preparing for its 25th wing ceremony, while Link's snoozing off. I swear, are the devs trying to tell us something? Cause this definitely isn't the first time. Despite that, he still won, but celebrations came to a sudden halt when Zelda took a skydive onto the surface, leaving Link with only one mission. <laughs> Taking my first steps around the academy, I couldn't help but feel like I was walking through some sort of water painting. And believe it or not, Farron Woods was what started it. Wanting the first area players visit to be bright and easy to navigate, the designers created it with an illustrated storybook in mind. On the other hand, the Earth Temple design was inspired by Southeast Asian architecture, hence the heavy use of primary colors. Now for all you Zelda players out there, I'm sure rolling around with Link has probably been beaten into your muscle memory. Well, praise the Lord, the devs finally fixed this issue. Fujibayashi felt the hit stun from rolling into a wall was too much of a pace breaker, so he gave Link a stamina meter. Though I never had a problem with rolling, to be honest, since it actually gave me something to do when moving around. <laughs> Alright, the next thing I want to talk about is... The Beetle. And oh my god, did it go through some interesting concept designs. Well, it simply started off as Link's traditional boomerang. Though of course, the devs wanted to squeeze every ounce of motion plus they could into every action. And that's what they did. But soon realized, who the heck controls the boomerang like this? It just felt awkward. So what now? Well, this was when the team reminisced on cartoons in the 1970s, where rocket fish shooting robots was the craze. Link's boomerang suddenly became full-blown rocket fists. But robot rocket fists in a Zelda game? That seemed quite absurd and didn't match the technology. Hence, they decided to create an advanced ancient civilization, which became the Lanaru Mines, along with the Time Shift Stones. Though eventually, they settled with just a beetle. <laughs> So from what I've gathered, there are two extremely controversial things about Skyward Sword that's a make or break for players. One is the motion plus controls, and the other is Fi or Fi or whatever. Truth be told, according to designer Ruji Kobayashi, her concept was inspired by anime in the 1980s. In a majority of them, main characters are often accompanied by a beautiful assistant. So that's what Fee was to Link. But did she really have to be this robotic as well? As for her design, the devs experimented with many, many concepts. In the end, settled with the Fairy Queen from The Wind Waker. From what we've seen, the Zelda team has never failed to bring something fresh to the table with every release. So it's only natural to wonder, what gimmick is coming up over the horizon? Oh wow. This man right here was responsible for this brilliant concept, director Hiromasa Shikata. Funny thing is, he didn't even know if it was going to be fun at first, until they played around with the prototype where all sorts of neat puzzle ideas popped up. Now that they've got a foothold on gameplay, it was time to decide on the direction. Miyamoto wanted it to be based on old Zelda titles. And we have two contenders duking it out tonight. Contestant number one, the dense and complicated Majora's Mask. And on the other side, we've got the staples and fundamentals of A Link to the Past. Realizing the surreal effects of switching from a top-down view to a side view, especially on the 3DS, the victor was clear. 
Speaking of the top-down view, would you be shocked if I told you that Link's actually doing a reverse Michael Jackson anti-gravity lean wherever he goes? Can't tell, huh? But if we move the camera, then... To clarify, the devs did this so players could get a better view of all the objects. Cause if it was a true top-down perspective, Link would basically only be a tiny green triangle. The game was released in November of 2013, called The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds. Events take place centuries after A Link to the Past, and as you can guess by now, Link oversleeps yet again. He soon finds himself tasked with a little errand, but ends up coming face to face with Yuga, who seems to be a big fan of the Joker. Hmm? Understanding his evil schemes, Link slides in and out of walls to save the day. A Link Between Worlds truly breaks from Zelda's traditional gameplay formula. Beat dungeon, get item, use it to reach next dungeon. Instead, players could now go wherever and whenever. Believe it or not, this idea actually came from one of Aonuma's hobbies, which he never disclosed. But imagine you've never went water skiing before, but wanted to try it. Naturally, it would be an enormous investment, buying the skis, the boat, the life jacket, and so on. But thanks to the wonderful invention of rentals, you can try before you buy. So that's how Ravio Shop came to be. Personally speaking, I think the system is a lot more noob friendly, but not overpowered. It's nice to throw out a tornado or an ice beam to see how things will react without having to worry about the numbers. Unfortunately, because of this system, we lose that wonderful sense of item discovery felt in previous Zelda games. Overall, A Link Between Worlds is another strong entry. The use of 3D effects are perfect, and the dungeon designs are fresher than ever, thanks to the new merge into walls mechanic. Wow, this is it. We've covered every single Zelda title released to date. Skipping to present day, Nintendo has teased us with a short trailer for a new Zelda game made with the help of Tecmo Toei called Hyrule Warriors. All we know is that it's combat orientated and takes aspects from Dynasty Warriors. As for the Wii U, who knows what exciting things are in store for us. And finally, here's a little message Miyamoto left for us in the Hyrule Historia, and I quote, Link's adventure will go on for as long as you continue to love his world. With new hardware will come new games in this series. And empathetically, I ask you to please give them a shot. Well guys, it's been one hell of a ride. If you've made it all the way here from part one, thank you so, so much. You got through it. We got through it. Shoutouts to my friend who helped me out a lot with editing. More formal introductions later on. Also, shoutouts to East Beast Films for his wonderful cartoon animations and intro. You guys should go check out his YouTube channel if you haven't done so already. Now with all that said, as usual, here's a little riddle. Solve it and the secrets to our next retrospective shall be yours. My home's very beautiful, with palm trees growing left and right. Watching the sunset on one is certainly a beautiful sight. Too bad I'll soon be leaving without a chance to say goodbye, but never will I stop fighting to take back what was mine. I'll be traveling to many places while meeting many new faces. The mission is to find my friends, cause only then may our sorrows end.